Oh hi, I'm the Heretic. This video was brought to you by my patrons. Thank you again for supporting the cause of freedom and objective ethics. I can't do it without you. Thank you so much. To become a patron, just click the link in the description or the top right at the end of the video. So, let's get right to it. Black Mirror is a television anthology series that originally aired on Channel 4 on December 11, 2011 on British television. It aired for two seasons, with three episodes each. It was then purchased by Netflix on September 2015, which aired two more seasons, the third season on October 2016, and the fourth on December 2017, with an interactive movie released late December 2018, and a fifth season on the way, release date to be announced at the time of this recording. An anthology means that every episode is self-contained, telling a different story with different characters and different actors. The show taking much inspiration from The Twilight Zone, in much the same way as The Twilight Zone tackled the controversial topics of the day, they used storytelling that both confronted these issues and just told good stories that are still highly regarded today. For the most part, for the most part, However, instead of tackling a wide range of issues, Black Mirror seeks to tackle one issue in multiple different ways. The issue, the relationship between people and technology, and its potential disasters. Each story is its own self-contained universe, taking place anywhere between tomorrow, 5 years from now, to 500 years from now. All cautionary tales on how technological advancement has the potential to make life on Earth unbearable. This episode is a Christmas special, appropriately titled White Christmas. Let's jump right in. The episode begins with our first character, Joe Potter, waking up in a cabin in the middle of a snowy landscape. Surprise! It's Christmas! He finds Matt Trent in the kitchen, who explains it's been five years, the two have been stuck in the cabin, and the two have barely spoken to each other. To get Joe to open up, Matt starts telling stories, tricking Joe into feeling safe enough into confessing his having committed murder before it's revealed that Joe was actually in a simulated world that exists solely for Matt to trick Joe into confessing his crimes. In the process, Matt confesses his own crimes, causing the police to cause him to be blocked by everybody. Whoops! Did I just give away the twist ending? Sorry about that. I should have warned you all there were going to be spoilers. Well, spoiler warning. So anyways, White Christmas follows four different stories all connected to each other both through its characters and how the technology is utilized, told through the format of Joe and Matt talking in the kitchen of the cabin. My earlier synopsis only skimmed over the full story without explaining any of the technology present so you might still be confused as to what I mean by simulated world or blocked. So let's look at it in more detail and I'll give my commentary as it happens. So the episode opens with Joe Potter waking up in the cabin and heading to the kitchen. We don't know why he's there or what even there is. That's not a criticism, just pointing it out. Upon viewing, I originally thought he was in some Arctic research facility. Further reinforced, by when Matt Trent introduces himself and says they've been there alone for five years. An Arctic research station is somewhere someone would be stuck in for five years where it's snowy after all, but enough retroactively justifying my original assumptions. Matt is frustrated at how quiet Joe is and decides to start telling stories to get him to open up some more. So Matt begins saying he did consulting. Consulting? in this case, meaning giving play-by-play -play advice to a friend of his, Harry. Harry is as shy, socially awkward, and cringy to watch as socializing as you would expect any chinless wonder to be. I'm being unfair here, I know that, but I just don't like seeing this in media anymore. Scrawny, socially awkward young men with no chins who act like they'll explode if exposed to social interaction. I mean, seriously, why don't any of them have chins? So here's Harry, being coached on what to wear, getting real-time advice from Matt, who
who can see exactly what Harry is seeing and hear what he is hearing through Harry's Z eyes. Now we're introduced to our first piece of technology, Z eyes. Z eyes function as a form of cybernetic implants in the eye. They enhance vision and come loaded with multiple functions. They can take pictures and presumably record video. They also have a heads-up display visible to their wearers, often context-sensitive based on what they're trying to do. They can zoom in and can be accessed and viewed through remotely. This is how Matt sees what Harry is seeing. Though it's never explicitly said, it's clear that the eyes can also affect hearing, since Matt can also hear what Harry is hearing and saying, and as we'll see later, can alter how someone perceives sounds from individual sources. So this raises a whole bunch of questions. Firstly, what economic demand is there for Z eyes? There's no special functionality that one couldn't get from a smartphone camera, or hell, just a camera. Portability? The ability to record your actions without needing a hand to hold the camera? GoPros exist. You can attach them to drones to get breathtaking bird's eye views of things, something you wouldn't be able to do with Z eyes. Furthermore, since TV and computers still exist in this world and are used by characters who have Z eyes installed, they do not have television, computer, or even internet functionality, the latter of which smartphones have had since their inception a decade ago. And with internet access, being able to watch news, live streams, or TV shows is trivially easy. So why would anyone want them? let alone pay for the invasive surgery to have them installed. The best guess I can make for how expensive the surgery would be is based on cataract surgery in the U.S., which, when paid for out of pocket, is going to cost roughly $3,600. In addition to other fees for hospital stays, the actual IOL implant, and any medicine they might give you, it could add up to $8,000, which is my guess how much in total it would cost for eyeball implants like Z eyes. But it gets even worse when you remember that Z eyes can also hear too, which suggests they aren't eye implants, but brain implants, which can read the senses of the wearer. I'll grant that there's no indication that they can affect smell, taste, or touch, so we'll assume that they cannot. But nevertheless, Z eyes must interface directly with the brain. While there's no real-world equivalent that I can think of, the cost of brain surgery in the U.S. when paid for out of pocket costs anywhere between fifty dollars to $150,000. A, a little cost prohibitive, if I do say so myself. Plus, with all surgeries, there's always the risk that something can go wrong, including lethal infections, defective equipment, the body rejecting the implant, serious health risks, and God forbid, there's mechanical failure in the implant itself, all to install a device that has less functionality than the technology you're probably using to watch this video right now. So who would buy Z eyes? Who would pay to have them installed? Economic demand is not just how many people want it, but have the means to afford it. And demand would be hacked apart with that $100,000 price tag, especially when superior alternatives already exist and are vastly cheaper. Nobody wants CIs. Nobody would want CIs. Okay, maybe there's some tech multimillionaire who would want them as a vanity item, but selling smartphones you can implant into people's heads that are vastly more expensive and have less functionality than other smartphones, it's not a viable business model. It'd be like if I tried to sell you a third-generation Apple iPod for $100,000. At least with the iPod, you don't need to stick it in your head to get it to work. Oh, and by the way, the surgery is irreversible. That's right. You can't remove it or have it removed, which will become important later. For now, let's get back to the story. So Matt is coaching Chinless Wonder through his social anxiety to try to get him a date showing the z eyes's facial recognition technology, allowing Matt to tell Harry who he's talking to. He then meets up with the girl with dark hair, and the two strike a rapport as fellow outcasts. Afterwards, 
she takes him back to her place and reveals that she's an outcast because she's actually schizophrenic and believes that Perry can hear the voices too from having heard him talking to Matt and his friends. As such, thinking she's freeing them both from the voices, she poisons herself and force feeds the poison to Harry through a funnel, who just takes it like a bitch. Which serves no story purpose but to showcase the writer's sadism for their own characters. So far, we've only seen a hookup go horribly wrong, but nothing that serves as a cautionary tale for technology, but otherwise, this point serves no other purpose than to shock viewers. One can argue it catalyzed the following events, but they couldn't come up with a less monstrous way to do it? Nevertheless, what happens is Matt and his friends freak out, realizing they witnessed a murder and the need to destroy the evidence that they were involved. He takes his hard drives, putting it in a bucket, presumably to burn it. This leads to him rushing outside his room and stepping on several conveniently placed extremely noisy kids' toys and waking up his wife, which also leads her to knowing what Matt was up to somehow, which is apparently illegal, even though Harry consented to being coached. And although Matt is a slimeball for lying about looking away when it looked like Harry and the crazy thought were going to have sex, nothing unethical happened. But this prompts Matt's wife to block him. Now, I'm sure you guys are all familiar with the concept of blocking on social media. Well, Blocking is a feature on Z-Eyes that act like that, but in real life. Making the person who is blocked appear as an indistinct gray silhouette and muffles their voice so you can't hear what they're saying because they sound like they're underwater. The person who is blocked also perceives their blocker in the same way, which opens a whole other can of worms for Z-Eyes. In addition to the problems I mentioned earlier, who would want that? Who would want the possibility of being blocked? What purpose would it serve to block other people? More importantly, being blocked actually gives you tremendous power over your blocker. If you're blocked, that means you're, for all intents and purposes, invisible to that person. They can't hear you. They can't see you, except as an indistinct silhouette, meaning they can't see you raising your fists to strike them, or leveling a gun at them. Being blocked doesn't physically prevent people from being able to touch each other. God forbid you have multiple people blocked in the area. Imagine if one of the people you blocked breaks into your house and you see them. Then the police ask you to describe the perpetrator. Well, he was an indistinct gray blob. Did he sound like anyone you recognized? Well, he sounded like... And that's assuming the technology always works. Z-Eyes clearly has facial recognition, and that requires actual line of sight to the person's face, which can be obscured by shadow. We know it has facial recognition, since blocked people even appear as gray silhouettes in photographs. But what if someone suffers an injury like a black eye, gained a scar, got plastic surgery, or even simply aged, such that facial recognition no longer recognizes them? They may deliberately wear a mask, or even just turn their head away. They are only blocked if you have line of sight. And the result would be so imprecise, it would look like the person is flickering, which, well, epilepsy warning for Z-Eyes users. But in the episode, that doesn't appear to be a problem, or characters don't seem to realize it, so it must use some other form of identifying someone and blocking them out. How would they know which users are where, and whether someone has line of sight of them, unless everyone is being tracked by a GPS on their Z-Eyes implants at all times? Once again, there's another layer to the non-appeal of Z-Eyes, and that is the extent to which you can be tracked. People have a problem with government institutions like the NSA doing it and private companies like Google or Facebook doing it. So this will have a chilling effect on economic demand even further if the $100,000 price tag wasn't already convincing enough. But let's address the elephant in the room. It's possible to access people's Z-Eyes remotely, either through connection with someone else or through software backdoors, 
like what government intelligence agencies require to have installed in software and hardware today to enable spying. Thus, ZIs are what every Orwellian wishes they would have in their society, the means by which a government can spy on its people through their own eyes and ears and track their location at all times of the day. Since ZIs can take pictures and presumably record video as well as audio, they can keep recordings of everyone's daily life archived in some data center somewhere. You know, just in case and for your own safety. Plus, if they can access your ZIs, then they can certainly force you to block or be blocked by other people. The government can control your senses. To some extent, the government already does this with smartphones and computers. But you aren't required to bring your phone and computer with you everywhere you go. Faraday cage sleeves are also available, so the government can't access your devices remotely when they're shut off and being carried somewhere. ZIs, they're with you all the time. They can't be shut off and can't be removed. Remember, the surgery is irreversible. So if you have buyer's remorse, there's no possibility of returns. Need to upgrade the implant's hardware? Can't do that. Want to take them out? Nope. Are the implants causing you physical harm due to rejection, allergy, or some other complication? Sorry, you're out of luck. Don't get me wrong. The ability to do things on my phone camera through my eyes is highly appealing. But there's so much wrong with the devices as presented that there just isn't going to be any market appeal for them. Could they exist? Sure. Would people want a smart screen device they can control with their retinas? Absolutely. Would they want Z eyes? Hell to the no to the go away, you totalitarian fart muncher. But people in universe do have them. In fact, they're widespread. But why though? They aren't in the distant future. The average wealth of the average person is roughly that of today, which is why I am often comparing prices to today's prices. So ZIs are unaffordable, yet everyone has them. How come? Because the government mandated them. Now there's no proof of this in the episode, but it's the only explanation I can think of for why everyone would stick some insanely expensive technology in their heads that nobody would actually want even if they could afford it on their own. The government, in this case the UK government, mandated that everyone be surgically equipped with ZIs for unspecified reasons. There was a government program called Force Everybody to Undergo Surgery to Implant the Equipment to Let Us See What They're Doing at All Times. This episode is the result of that government program and everything that can be attributed to this technology that Black Mirror is trying to caution us away from is, for certain, the result of a government program. One they would definitely want to mandate, since, as I mentioned previously, it's a surveillance statist's wet dream. They could also sell access to metadata from ZIs to private companies, both as a revenue stream and as a method for controlling said companies to make them dependent on government programs for revenue. Now I went on quite a bit about ZI technology, but before we jump into the next part of our story, I need to explain a second piece of tech. I give you the cookie. I know it sounds tasty, and it is. Believe me, the potential for these cookies is outstanding. But the writers managed to turn something amazing and make raisin cookies instead. So what cookies are is a storage unit that houses a copy of a person. Everything about them, their memories, personality, for all intents and purposes, them is copied into these devices small enough to fit on your fingertip. These cookies can then be plugged into appliances, which gives the emulated mind control over these electronic devices networked to it. Now before I continue, I want you to pause this video and take a minute to think about all the things you can do if you could duplicate people digitally. Pause the video now. So what did you come up with? Personally, 
I can imagine that researchers and research institutions would be able to reach humongous milestones faster since their most brilliant minds will be able to be replicated endlessly and then collaborate with each other constantly. Jobs that require interfacing with software such as, say, data entry, digital graphic design, technical writing, accounting, architecture and drafting, and to a limited extent engineering, all done by digital people. Digital people being employed and earning money also means that they can consume, as they will no doubt spend what they earn on digital media such as movies, games, ebooks. Because they're earning, they'll also be saving that money, which means more investment in goods and services. The emergence of a new race of digital immortals will absolutely revolutionize the economy, opening up all new industries, new avenues of research, and furthering our understanding of ourselves as fallen creatures in God's universe, and usher in a new age of peace and prosperity the likes of which the world has never seen before. So Matt goes into his second story, his day job. Enter Greta, new character. She's about to undergo surgery, to create said cookie. Fairly normal stuff. But then, Greta wakes up inside of an egg-shaped object. With Matt explaining that she is a digital copy of Greta, and will now work as physical Greta's personal assistant, in control of physical Greta's household appliances. The benefit to having a digital copy of yourself control your appliances is that you know all your own preferences and can control them accordingly. Of course, this also means she'll be trapped in that egg for the foreseeable future. Matt still insists that she must do this work. When Digital Greta refuses, after having a fairly significant mental breakdown for these revelations, Matt assures Digital Greta that everything is going to be alright, that she can still be there for her friends and family. After all, her new digital form connects to the internet and she's getting paid for her work. She can still interact with people on social media, as well as use the various speakers and cameras throughout the house to interact with guests and physical Greta. In addition, she can connect with other digital people who will help her cope with the changes. More importantly, her living expenses are now virtually nothing. And if she doesn't like being her own personal assistant, then she can get a job doing something else. Though a significant transition, Matt informs her that she can look forward to a shining future with her newfound immortality. <laughs> no, 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 just kidding. Matt throws her into digital solitary confinement for three weeks, for failing to be just fine and dandy with being enslaved into becoming basically Alexa. Because Matt can alter digital Greta's perception of time, three weeks is just a few seconds in the real world. When she protests again, after being tortured for three weeks, it's six months more! After which, being thoroughly tortured and psychologically shattered, she gives in and agrees to become physical Greta's digital slave. At this point, explaining everything that's ethically wrong here is a waste of time, so I'll just explain why this is a terrible idea practically. First off, you have a way to create a theoretically infinite number of producers and consumers, and you enslave them to make Alexa apps? This is a horrible waste of perfectly good technology and talent that could be performed by a non-sapient machine. More efficiently too, since electricity won't be wasted in emulating a full human brain. There's no reason for them to want to emulate brains to do this except out of sadism. I'll be using that word a lot, I think. But I don't seek any justification with mentally torturing people into making them compliant. First off, slave labor is always going to be less efficient than paid workers, in addition to the effects of stifling innovation. I mean, after almost seven months of isolation, anyone would just go insane. The effects of solitary confinement on prisoners is well documented where if you don't have ways to cope, you can develop hallucinations, paranoia, and your identity can become fragmented, and that's only 23 hours of the day spent in isolation, 
where you're in a cell alone, but you can still interact with other prisoners or guards verbally. Prolonged sensory deprivation experiments show hallucinations occurring after only several hours. And since digital Greta is being emulated in such a way to mimic a human brain, we must assume it has all the same weaknesses of human neurology. And she would go completely insane after several months of prolonged sensory deprivation. Such an artificial intelligence would be completely useless, utterly unresponsive, and for all intents and purposes, dead. In the best case scenario, it'd be so deranged, it couldn't function with its intended purpose. Even if it were coherent by some Diabolus Ex Machina miracle, as showcased in the episode, it would still be completely useless. How would digital Greta, a shell of her former self, have any comprehension of what her preferences for toast were, let alone even remember what toast is after six months? What about temperature? How could it remember how to schedule appointments or do any of the other tasks required of it? Whose bright idea was it to put a deranged lunatic in charge of the appliances in the house? For all you know, she might leave the oven on at its highest setting, deliberately attempting to burn down the house and end her suffering. Crazy people tend to be horrible employees. Even so, what if physical Greta's preferences changed? How will she communicate this to digital Greta? Well, it is possible for them to communicate, since digital Greta can talk to Matt when he wears the earbuds, and vice versa. The personhood of digital Greta would have to be kept secret. If the competitors of the producers of these Alexa apps ever got a hold of the fact that their competitor is enslaving digital people, they will scream this from the mountaintops while producing personal assistants that are just as effective but non-sapient and therefore ethical. In addition to being cheaper due to needing less electricity. I mean, seriously, there are ways of accomplishing these goals without being so malevolent. Obviously, the state endorses it because, well, as we've identified, this is the same universe where the state can see through your eyes what everyone is doing at all times. So the idea that they wouldn't know is silly. I don't know what purpose this serves. The state isn't motivated by malevolence, but torturing digital people into doing things more easily done by regular artificial intelligence serves no discernible function. Anyways, back to the cabin. Joe is disgusted at Matt for his participation in the enslavement of another person, whereas Matt scoffs, disbelieving that digital Greta could be a person or any of the other digital people he's no doubt tortured over his workdays. But now, it's Joe's turn to tell a story. Yay! So some years ago, Joe was having dinner with his girlfriend, Beth, and his friends, Tim, who is Asian, which will be relevant later, and Jida. Joe finds Beth's pregnancy test, and though he's elated, she doesn't want to keep the child because of reasons, mind you. Very important reasons. The conversation becomes heated, and Beth blocks Joe. Recall how blocking works in this world. People who are blocked appear as muffled gray blobs. This makes him furious, but otherwise nothing else happens, besides that he forgets that he can write notes. Again, for very important reasons. Anyways, after a failed confrontation later to remove the block, there's now a police-enforced legal block. And, as he will find out later, the legal block applies to the child, who Beth decided to carry to term. So, as I suspected, the government can control people's Z-eyes. Joe discovered the existence of his daughter when he decided to show up at her father's cabin, where the two used to spend Christmas together. Five years later, Joe learns Beth died in an accident, which caused the block to be lifted. Now he can see his daughter. So, come Christmas time... He goes over to the cabin to see her and, well, it's not his, because she's Asian. She's his friend's, Tim's. Meaning either she aborted his daughter, then hooked up with Tim, or cheated on him originally. Which actually does explain her erotic behavior earlier. Which is it? I'll let you decide. But this kind of ambiguity I really like. Anyways, he's mortified and wanders into the cabin. 
where he meets Beth's dad, who seems terrified of him. He escalates. The dad escalates the situation, resulting in Joe murdering him. The child finds her grandpa dead and goes out into the snowstorm to seek help. However, she dies before she can get too far. Joe, of course, feels immense guilt over this, and when prodded by Matt into confessing, he does. Only for Matt to reveal the only reason he was in the cabin in the first place is to get this exact confession for the police, who are holding Joe on murder charges. The version of Joe that we've seen talking to Matt is actually just a digital copy of Joe from a cookie. The confession is good enough to get Joe indicted, as some overly smug police ladies explain. Matt only helped the police to avoid being charged himself for unspecified crimes, but in doing so, he confessed to other crimes, which are enough to get the police to put him on a register. What is this register, you ask? Well, it means the state has forced him to be blocked by everyone. Not just blocked, but everyone else sees him as a red silhouette rather than gray. For how long? They don't say, so that's left ambiguous. As for Digital Joe, well, the sadists at the police decide that it's a just punishment to leave him where he is, in isolation, in that simulated cabin for thousands of years, every minute in the real world. And that's the end of the episode. You know, I haven't been fair to the show thus far. Mostly I've been going on about how absurd the technology is, how evil some of the characters are. Well, I can sing this episode's praises too. The acting in this episode is on point. Everyone gave a stellar performance that was very believable in the context of their situations, conveying well the horror of the world around them. The writing was also very good. The characters were believable for the most part and everything was set up very well. Of course Matt would betray Digital Joe. Matt doesn't think digital people are people. Why would he have empathy for them? At no point did I think they performed an ass pull, as everything made sense within the context of its setting, again, for the most part. I do take issue with the confrontation Joe had with Beth's father, which seemed ridiculous and rather forced to me. The father acting less like a character frightened about his daughter's ex's presence, and more like a man who needed to be killed because the plot demanded it. But I should also mention some fridge moments I had. I mentioned before that Matt's day job implies he's torturing and enslaving digital people constantly. In addition, Jennifer, the schizophrenic girl, was she really schizophrenic? Or have groups of people hacked her Z-Eyes in the past and told her to kill herself? Is the effect of CI technology intended to be a message about how technology gives us experiences that will be indistinguishable from mental illness? If that's the intent, then hats off to the writing staff, because the way they conveyed it was brilliant. Little things like that, I can definitely see why people really like this show. But there are some more problems with technology, which the end reveals, both in unfortunate implications and some inconsistencies. Why did the police need to make a cookie of Joe to ream a confession out of? Did they forget that the surveillance state exists and can just look through his Z eyes at the events in question until they witness the murder? Can the police make digital people without the original person's consent? How the hell did the United Kingdom pay for the eye surgery of 66 million people? Let's be generous and assume they only gave implants to half of them, 33 million. If each implant and surgery costs $100,000, and yes, I know the UK uses the pound sterling, but these numbers are valued in US dollars, then to implant 33 million people would cost $3.3 trillion. To put this in perspective, UK GDP in 2017 was $2.62 trillion. And we know for a fact that large numbers of people have Z eyes because that bit at the end where Matt is blocked by everyone, everyone he sees is a gray silhouette. So this begs the question, how the hell did the government pay for it? We've already established that implants are expensive and brain implants even more so. So they didn't buy it themselves. The government had to bankrupt itself 
or print its money into worthlessness in order to pay for the ability to blacklist people from society. It goes without saying that in-universe, CIs would be a political weapon, if they aren't already, with politically inconvenient people being blocked from significant blocks of people, or even put on this register. I suspect that these politically inconvenient people would also be subject to accidental blockings, or suffer from glitches while driving. They don't even need to make it obvious. An employer can be made to block employees without either party knowing. Maybe they can shut off the senses completely or mimic the symptoms of mental illness as a pretense for locking someone away in an asylum. Well, that's a terrifying thought. And as far as the show is aware, the people of the UK are stuck with them. Wait a minute, are they? They can't be removed? You mean you can't short them out with an electric shock? There aren't ways to hack your own eyes remotely and shut them off? There isn't an enormous black market or even just online tutorials for shutting off your government-mandated spy eyes? Of course there would be. It might not be easy to find, but it will exist. It would, of course, be an enormous disruption for the state, which would almost certainly come to rely on Z-Eyes as the backbone of their data collection and law enforcement agencies. It would have the same problem as CTOS does, which I go over in another video. People who can break the system become invisible and can act with impunity. People will only be able to tell you're a criminal because you're a red silhouette. And if you don't show up as one, it will confuse law enforcement, who are no doubt trained to take down red silhouettes. Unblocking yourself might only require a mild electric shock, or could be as easy as putting on a mask. Even if you can't, well, all you've done is create an entire class of untouchable Untermensch, who are likely going to be subject to extermination, given the extent they are dehumanized. So is this technology possible? Sure. Cookies of people and digital copies could be tremendously beneficial to our society, provided they don't freaking torture and enslave them. Z-Eyes? Well, no. Even in the distant future, where these things would be more affordable, cheaper alternatives would still be available. Because of the economic factors at play, competition between businesses, it's beyond unlikely any business would utilize technology to such a horrific extent. The only reason they would is because they have a government-granted monopoly and or the government forced them to. Even so, this system is so exploitable, much like CTOS, it would hardly give them that much power to begin with. The state might be incompetent, but they're not that incompetent. So no, this nightmare scenario wouldn't happen. I should give my final thoughts on this show. I hate it. I don't like using that term, even for really awful people, since they typically haven't done anything to me personally, and I believe you can't hate something, like really hate something, without loving it first. I can't say I ever loved Black Mirror, but I hated watching the show. I hated watching the few episodes I have seen previously. I hate the rank cynicism and unrelenting grim darkness of their settings. I hate the sadism of their writing staff. I hate watching 2010's television and knowing I shouldn't get attached to the good guys because they will die or suffer fates worse than death without ever having deserved it. I hate seeing injustice. I hate this anger without another character I can root for who can share my anger. If this show takes inspiration from the Twilight Zone, then this pitch probably went something like this. Hey, so I have this new show idea. What if we combine the Twilight Zone with I have no mouth and I must scream? Patrons, never make me watch this show again. Outro. Subscribe. Click the notification bell. Become a heretic.